Okay, hi everybody. Uh, today is Tuesday, August 21st. My name is Aaron Krickenberger. This is the Kubernetes SIG testing weekly meeting. This is being recorded uh, publicly and will be posted to YouTube uh, later today, assuming I remember to do this. Um, uh, so on the agenda today, we got Steve who wants to talk about disruptive tests on AWS with COPS. Uh, Timothy St. Clair wants to talk about issue routing and tags. I have a couple things I want to talk about with respect to automating all the things and just uh, what I've been up to in the conformance domain. Um, and then uh, at the end, Patrick's adding some agenda items on uh, adding additional secrets uh, to Prowl. So with that, I will hand off to Steve. Steve, take it away. Yeah, so basically um, some feedback that I got uh, from some engineers is that it's basically impossible to write any disruptive tests on AWS because the way that the COPS um, setup works is all the nodes get put into auto-scaling groups. So basically, if you want to disrupt the cluster and take a node down, like the actual AWS auto-scaling group will terminate that instance, start a new one for you very handily. Um, and I, I wanted to know what was the, like, the larger direction there? Because it, it, like those tests were, like I think there was, there was a PR, fairly large PR that merged and it was merged with like um, sort of a bunch of hand wringing about the fact that they couldn't actually test the functionality that was going in. And is, is that like something that's just never gonna change in COPS? Do we have any plans on, on allowing those sorts of disruptive tests? As someone from SIG cluster lifecycle COP, you'd have to talk with Justin. He's the pretty much the main maintainer for COPS going forwards and it's behind the times. I've long been frustrated by the fact that it is in the blocking PR jobs and that it is not periodic uh, because it is out of date, right? So it's this weird conundrum of, it, it, I'd much rather put kubeadm, which lives on master, and actually is released with master and all the other artifacts in the main line to do mainline testing for a lot of these other things and push that into AWS along with the cluster API implementation, which folks are work currently working on. Uh, it makes a ton more sense uh, for the long haul for supportability. If you want a blocking PR job, uh, then that, but that's, that's kind of been my opinion. They're, they're, I know Justin added it to get more signal to prevent issues that would go down the line, but because there aren't maintainers who are actively working on latest versions, it is now kind of a bottleneck. Did anybody else lose Tim, or is it just me? I can I still Tim. hear. I can still see in here, Tim. It's just you. You were saying so, there's no active maintainers for it. There's people who are side maintaining it. Hey. Oh man, my connection is horrible. Can everybody hear me okay? <laughs> okay, so like, um, what can we use today, aside from COPS, as the canonical way of standing up clusters on AWS? Uh, nothing yet. Okay, so that's why, like, that's why we're using COPS. Um, but it doesn't need to be PR blocking though. So hang on, because um, like, I think I'm kind of a joker who helped get it into PR blocking, and it was partially that if we're going to block PRs on cloud VMs, then it seems like we should have two different clouds to make sure that the failures we're chasing are with the tests themselves and not the cloud itself. Longer term, I think blocking on cloud VMs and standing up an entire cluster in a cloud for pull request tests is a horrible idea it takes forever. And so we want to actually move in a direction where no clouds are involved in blocking pre-submit tests and they are all post-submit tests. But the world we're in today is that those two clouds give us sufficient coverage of E2E tests and we're working on a solution that gives us comparable coverage of E2E tests, but we're not there yet. So like, I agree with your opinion that the state of today is bad, but I'm not sure that we really have any appreciable place to go right now because everybody is working on the things that make it better. Okay, right. that's cool. And I guess um, the, the other part of this is I, like that was AWS specific functionality too. So I guess, you know, it could be argued like that shouldn't, you know, that should be cloud provider federated testing and not necessarily 
Yeah, yeah that, that's probably like a larger discussion that I um, I really hate being the blocker for it, but like I, I have an interest in you know trying to write that document that describes the path to like how do you submit your results, how do you submit post submit results, how do you get from like how can we verify that you're generating good signal? How can we make sure that that's worth blocking on? Thing, things of that nature, and we're not we're not quite there yet. There should also be all over the code. There are GCP specific tests inside of the end-to-end -end test suite, and you could simply wrap that portion with a issue and reference that issue, so that way it can be fixed over time as folks tread into cluster API. And if they have a certain incantation that uses ASGs or not, that's that's an implementation choice, not necessarily a limitation of the cloud provider itself, but a limitation of with how COPS is using the provider. Yeah, I like that's something I plan on getting to as I sweep through and try and identify a bunch of tests that make more sense as conformance tests. It could be that there are a lot of tests that were shoddily written that are skipped if the provider is GCE because um, the person who originally wrote the test only had the GCE cluster to test it on and nobody with access to an AWS cluster has taken the time to make sure that the test is written well and meaningful as such that it triggers a, a, you know, an appropriate fault on an AWS cluster and that recovery happens similarly. So like, uh, what's the plan for disruptive tests? I'm not sure I would go ask AWS, but what's the plan for COPS? I don't know, I would go ask the COPS maintainer. Um, but like neither of those disruptive things are really things that I wanna talk about in the context of PR tests. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, anything else on that or should we move to Tim's topic next? Okay, Tim, you have the floor. The, there are tags that exist inside the test because it was meant to uh, help to route issues. Uh, the problem with that is that some of the suites are stood up uh, for a given provider. And when the test fails, there should be like a canonical ordering for who to route the test to. And this occurs for a bunch of different things. So we haven't really thought through uh, how to properly route things. So sometimes the CI signal lead, the poor soul has to go to all the SIGs to try and find the right person and then eventually hits pay dirt. Um, but we should do probably- an, Do you have an example of one of these tests? Yes, I do. And I can link it into the, into the okay. meeting notes. Like, but uh, this specific one was the cluster upgrade tests that have been failing for GCE for a long time. And it has nothing to do with SIG cluster lifecycle. Uh, and even, in fact, it doesn't even have anything to do with GCE. It's, it's deep down somewhere in GCE storage. So it's like, it's orthogonal. It, it almost belongs in SIG storage. So the, that routing is basically the poor CI signal person was poking us forever. And we're like, we kind of ignored them for a while because it, we weren't seeing it in other suites. And then they came to the SIG meeting and uh, we, we dug into it and we're like, no, this has nothing to do with us at all. So that routing process, we should probably be refined and thought about. So to provide some context on that, I helped write the routing process for a CI signal. Um, and the way that I wrote it was there are two SIGs. And in fact, I talked about this at the community meeting last week, but just to rehash it, there, there should be two SIGs that you go contact first, right? You should first, Take a look at the SIG that owns the job. Um, who's in charge of the, the health of the job as a whole? And then who's in charge of the health of the individual test case? Generally speaking, the individual test cases have the little SIG name in the tag there. And then the job itself, it used to be we had a massive JSON file for all of the jobs and there was a SIG field there. I think we're moving in a different direction. So we don't have a great way of canonicalizing a SIG that owns the job, but um, I think like both of those need to be consulted in the poor CI signal souls case because they don't necessarily have the subject matter expertise to define whether it is a failure of the job itself or whether it is a failure of the specific test case. And I understand that SIG cluster lifecycle is put in this really unfortunate position because upgrade tests are almost always where all of the failures are with release related stuff. But I'm more interested in figuring out how we can like work through that quicker 
as opposed to having people be ignored with no real reason given. It, it, we, I think it was just a matter of people didn't have enough bandwidth. People looked at it, they gave back feedback, then it, it wasn't progressing the way they wanted to, so they showed up to the SIG meeting, and that's when progress was made. So the, I think the problem in general is there's a ton of signal inside of the system. Right. On average, I get upwards of 150 emails a day, 200 easily. So getting signal out of the system so that way it's not, you know, it, it's properly triaged in a reasonable time frame is, is always the conundrum. Do you have any proposed solutions? I think if we had an updated process, which routed from job first, right? So like that specific job should have been routed through GCP folks first, right? And that but would solve the problem faster. The, the difficulty I think is that generally, and maybe we're getting off into the least related weeds here, but I believe people associate the cluster upgrade jobs with cluster lifecycle because how a cluster gets upgraded is functionally there, like cluster life cycle. There, there, there's two separate jobs. There are actually dozens of jobs. So the, the problem with this one is that it's, there are KubeADM upgrade jobs and there are GCE specific upgrade jobs and they are totally different control code paths. So the problem there is that the slash cluster repository, which was like supposed to be deprecated for years, uh, still lives on, right? And that's yes. owned only by Google. Google are the only people that maintain and, and run that stuff. I'm not sure that's correct. That I is 100% correct because Robert Bailey is the only owner and he has to poke people to get it to move, right? Okay, um, but in, con in the context of the project, there is no such thing as a single company owning a thing that's a part of the core project, right? So it does ultimately fall to SIG cluster lifecycle as a whole. Even if you want to say that Robert's the bottleneck. The, on right? the owner's file, there are only, SIG cluster lifecycle is not the owner and shouldn't be aliased as the owner because we, those folks don't maintain it, right? So it's all about ownership and maintainership of code. By definition, SIG cluster lifecycle does not maintain or own that code, right? We aim, maintain and own all of the stuff around KubeADM and Cluster API and that stuff, but no one from the SIG actually owns and maintains that code. So none of the leads do, only Robert Bailey is the last maintainer from Google that routes things properly. So again, because there are two control paths that are totally parallel, the tests themselves are useful, but the jobs exercise the stand-up completely differently. And because of that, we should probably route via job first and then test second. Okay. Um, I think that's fair. And I think like you should probably go propose this through SIG release because generally speaking, like, uh, you know, we've fallen back on this wonderful situation where we're leaning on a human to do the triage. Um, and I, I have a dream, I've had a dream for a while of automating and scripting that away. But I think the, the process would work best if we take the documented process that is being followed and automate that. So I would change the process that's being followed. And then we can see what we can do to, to actually automate that away. Um, but I, like, I agree, I'm not super happy that right now we, we're living in this kind of in-between state where jobs aren't, um, I'm not sure if it's clear anymore who owns which job. Um, so in that sense, perhaps we're due for another sorting of jobs amongst SIGs. And then I think that's a perfectly reasonable argument to say that I'm not sure like the entire cluster directory is owned by Google, but I certainly think the cluster GCE directory is owned by Google. I'm not sure about things like Juju or Kubernetes anywhere. Um, but yeah, we, like whatever. It's the GCE directory that's pretty much uh, pertinent here. Okay. Um, so next up, uh, I, yeah, you know what? I'll go ahead and share my screen just so y'all can walk along here. Um, I wanted to give you a heads up on some of the automate all the things work I've been doing, uh, I gave a heads up about this at Contributor Experience and again at Community. 
I'm basically trying to take another push on um, this issue here where I set up merge automation for every single Kubernetes repo in every single actively managed Kubernetes org. Um, so I've got a table going here, which is probably a little bit out of date as of today, where I wanna make sure that every single repository lives somewhere in the SIGs YAML file. So I know that it is, a, it is a owned by a SIG. Um, making sure that there's an owner's file within that repository, making sure that we have approved functionality turned on so that people can uh, use slash LGTM and slash approve, uh, making sure that it's, uh, it's in the tied queries so that, you know, when somebody slash LGTM and slash approves a PR, it gets merged. And then finally, are any of the branches protected automatically by a branch protector, which runs daily? Uh, so I've been rolling through on all of this. Uh, where we're at right now is I, a lot of our automation depends upon uh, certain labels. A couple of the plugins are written in not the greatest fashion where if the label doesn't exist, it just goes ahead and creates it. So I am pre-creating all the labels in all the orgs. Uh, I have a pull request out there that I asked for lazy consensus on. Um, I got uh, an okay from the owner of all the Kubernetes client repos. I'm not really sure I can hope for the same from all the Kubernetes incubator repos. Uh, so I'll put this in by Friday. Uh, that then leaves, uh, getting SIG YAML done and getting all of the owner files done. Again, I kind of need to go through and update this, but there's one repo to be deleted and contrib. I have proposed gets owned by SIG architecture under the guise that contrib is a repo that really shouldn't have existed for years and years at this point. That's one of those things we all love to say that, oh, contrib is dead, yet pull requests still keep showing up into it. So I think that if SIG architecture is the SIG in charge of making sure the project's code is well organized, they are the SIG that's in charge of getting code out of contrib into other places. Uh, similarly for owner's files, mostly repos in the Kubernetes client org don't have owner's files, I'm working through those. Um, any oh, so then the two questions I kind of have for the group and I'll, I'll run through the rest of the community as well is I'm not really sure if it makes sense to go ahead and turn on those two commenter jobs that everybody calls Fatabot, the the one job that goes through and comments slash lifecycle stale on things that haven't been touched in 90 days and then rotten if they haven't been touched in another 30 and then closes them after another 30 for a grand total of 150 days of inactivity to from open to close. Uh, there's also a job that'll just automatically spam retest on pull requests that are LGTMs and approved but aren't passing for whatever reason and we just assume there must be flakes, so we spam retest. But those are way, way easier to enable org-wide than on a per repo basis. I'm not sure if anybody here has any thoughts or opinions. Why are, cool. they, why are they easier org-wide? Isn't it just the, um, the search query that you're adding on the job there? Yeah, it's just like less copy-paste in the search oh, query. Copy I mean, I feel like the retester should be, no one's ever complained about the retester, have they? Generally, no, although it can get some spammy on some PRs, but I don't, I haven't taken the time to go collect data on that. Okay. I feel like that's much less contentious anyway. <laughs> yep. Uh, next thing, I already pasted about this in the SIG testing channel. There's a pull request I would love to see get merged today uh, where somebody has gone ahead, uh, Hippie has uh, modified the E2E framework so that it includes the test name in the user agent string. Uh, I know the example here shows file name, line number, but I was asking that perhaps we just trim it down to the test name here, complete with these tags that uh, Tim was talking about earlier. Uh, with this, we can, the user agent gets dumped into the audit log. We can scrape the audit log and generate API coverage information so we can see exactly which tests are hitting which API endpoints. Um, so if folks from this SIG can take a look at this and help push it through, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, so the other thing to discuss is I, uh, in chatting with Tim last night, um, I kind of want to try and be lazy about conformance and reuse the fact that we have all these conformance jobs that are continuously running and posting results every six hours. 
Um, I feel like I really ought to be able to click on one of these jobs, take these files and hand them over to the CNCF in order to make sure that these jobs are proof of certification or you know, uh, passing conformance tests. The thing we discovered last night is there were a bunch of tests that were getting run uh, that Sonoboy doesn't run. And it turns out that Sonoboy has a bunch of additional regular expressions that it uses to skip tests. So it skips all the tests that have kubectl client in their name. It skips any tests that are flaky, disruptive, have a feature tag in them, or are alpha. Um, I get it. These are all like fantastic criteria. Honestly, if there's a test that's tagged as conformance, but it's flaky, it shouldn't have been tagged as conformance in the first place. Um, my concern is this has allowed us to end up in a situation where the list of tests that Kubernetes defines as conformance as guarded by code here in the Kubernetes repo, and it goes through and it walks through all the code and it looks for anything with the conformance tag. That's basically about it. It doesn't bother to exclude any tests that have flaky or any tests that have slow. I'd love to demonstrate that to you here, but it actually strips out all tags when it dumps out the test names. But so there are tests in this list that we treat as the authoritative list of conformance tests that Sonoboy isn't running. And this is an issue because Sonoboy is listed as the way to run conformance tests as far as the CNCF is concerned. This is a discrepancy that bugs me and I'd like to get this discrepancy back, fed back up into the project. Um, any thoughts or comments there? So, yeah. We should do that. Um, the question of kube control stuff uh, will affect OpenShift uh, with ACLs to run it uh, introspectively. So the, there are some issues that we've uncovered along the way. We've already fixed a bunch of them. I know DIMS is on, but we fixed a long time ago. Uh, you couldn't even introspectively run the tests at all. Uh, but that's been fixed because it uses the in-cluster client. That was like around like the 1.9 timeframe. So this is just legacy uh, that should be fixed. And I think just no one has gone through and fixed it. I know that MML was originally the person from Google who was working on this stuff. And we had been conversing about fixing some of the things and we fixed some of them. We just haven't gone through and updated it again. So I think I'd be happy with making it jive. Ideally, this isn't really Sonoboy. This is actually the Kube Conformance Container. Uh, and I, I, we also talked with Matt a while ago, and uh, I would like to have that published as part of the build artifacts of Upstream so everybody's using the same Kube Conformance Container with the same regexes and the same relative process, right? So anyone could take that particular container. They couldn't take the Kubekins container. They never could because it had issues. It's very Google specific to test infra. Uh, but if we can publish a kube conformance container with, up, with upstream, I would gladly like to take that off of Heptio's hands and push that in upstream because that's what we wanted to do like in the 110 ish time frame a while ago. Oh, no, even earlier than that. Yeah. So, so um, I, I had a question. <clears throat> I had a question about this. So I, I learned last week or this week, I don't remember anymore. Uh, ben, brought, a colleague of mine was running conformance tests on, on some VMware stuff and uh, on master. And it turns out, right, that Sonobui apparently doesn't work with up to master, only on specific tagged releases. If things get switched over to an image that uses Sonobui, is that not going to work with the this again. This this all rely. This isn't necessarily Sonobui. Sonobui is a wrapped runner, right? It's it's a basically an executor framework for how to run many okay. tests and get the artifacts. This executes the kube conformance container. Ideally, if folks want to use it against master, and that was also part of MML's Matt's and I objective was to get that container into uh, what's it called into upstream. So that way upstream publishes this, the container as part of the release process itself. And then Sonobuy can execute uh, from anything, right? You could use that itself if you wanted to and you'd be good, right? Yeah, so it's, it's all like wrappers upon wrappers upon wrappers. Ultimately there's an E2E test binary that also needs like a kubectl binary and I think, uh, oh right, there's Ginkgo. 
So then Ginkgo calls the E2E test binary, but then there's a shell script that calls Ginkgo to call the E2E test binary. And then it's there's, not there's, that image, bad. there's a script no, I, I, that calls I, I, the script to call Ginkgo to call yeah. the binary. Yeah, it's inside of on, it. That is then called <laughs> by Sonobu. So, like ben, ben has explained all that, right? But it's like if you use Sonobu as the driver, it wasn't working with head. So right. at some Sonobu. level, that it, it's restricting it. Uh, no, yeah. you can You could. You could just specify a different container. So whatever. Oh, okay. oh but, god. But I, no, 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 I get it. I get it. Thank you. Dims, you have your hand up. Yeah. So kubekins, yes, it's possible to do what we want. Uh, it's not that bad. Uh, right now, I pasted a gist, which essentially starts local up cluster. But instead of running local up cluster, you can just run the test to uh, just changing the command line parameters to kube test. It's self-contained and it's easy to run. It's right. just that we need to, we probably have to streamline the UX a little bit more and uh, publish uh, how exactly to do it. Yeah, but Kubekins contains a bunch of stuff that, you know, it's creepy. Uh, so hang, like, hang on. <laughs> right. but is it easy to run? Yes. Uh, I mean, if you see, just, just is not very, uh, you know. Yeah, and also just to be clear, like Sonoboy ends up plumbing right down to E2E test. Um, Kube test also ends up plumbing down to E2E test. I, I would, but Sonoboy like calls a container that happens to have E2E test in it. I think that uh, I wish more of my teammates were here. So I apologize if I'm putting words in their mouths, but I think like we'd like to find a way to make kube test the canonical way of running tests. And if it turns out that has to invoke a, a Docker image in order to do so, okay. But like that's kind of the path to making sure that the way that tests are run in CI is the same way that the tests are run for conformance is the same way that the developer can run the tests for their local experience, right? Yeah, so I, would, I would very much like kube test can be used for a local development experience. We use kube test for CI. I'd like to get to the same place for conformance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and That's I what, think it's possible even now. Uh, I just had to go and uh, poke at it, but then we might have to strip it down a little bit more. Um, yeah, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah. true. Like kube test kind of isn't the fully self-contained thing that a Docker image is because it does ultimately still end up calling out to hack e2e ginkgo.sh which calls ginkgo. Right. Calls yeah, e2. and so my usual problem with Sonoboy was how do I get it to run against the code that I modified, right? So uh, yep. that was the other issue that that Eric always... Uh, yeah. Previously so, talked about um, extending kube test to be able to use an image to stand up the infrastructure. And I've, I've poked around at that. I haven't had the bandwidth to really work on that, but maybe that same process in terms of, uh, you know, could be leveraged or, or if there's gonna be work done on this, um, at least at least be aware of it. So, so maybe it could be extended to also be used to stand up the infrastructure. The, the only, I, I would prefer to be looped into any canonical container that gets published. There are, there are fixes that we have inside of the kube conformance container that allow it to clean itself up afterwards because not of the cleaning, right now part of the testing infrastructure destroys the provisioning. And if you're doing this on someone's premises, being, being a good steward is super important. And we have that auto fixing in there and that's, that's important. Yeah. I I think that might get some traction as a Q4 goal. I don't know what your bandwidth is like, but I'm guessing that's what our bandwidth. I, uh, and I, that was a two, I mean, I would figure that would be a two part thing, right? One standing up infrastructure and the other is running and cleaning up tests. I mean, it could all be a single image, but I, I would think it would be two images. You'd have the infrastructure image and then you, or multiple infrastructure images. Ideally they could be interchanged. Yeah, in your case, Andrew, I was suggesting like if the canonical way to stand up a cluster in your cloud of choice happens to be running G cloud, great, run G cloud. That's what we do sure. for one thing, right? If it happens to be run an image that does all that, great, run the image. Like, I'd Yeah, exactly. But ideally, instead of it being specific to me, any extensions to kube test would just be run an image. And it just, you know, uh, adheres to some type of we need this output, like it's grokked and, you know, tells me where the cluster is, yada, yada. Yeah, it doesn't really care what it's standing up or where it's standing it up. It just knows it stands something up. Uh, Andrew, uh, dig into the uh, dash dash provider and dash dash deployment. Those two. Oh, no, yeah, that's what I've been looking at. Yeah, yeah, I've just been, I'll talk with you offline, Dems, because, yeah. yeah. It wasn't that hard to uh, plug in local up cluster and other people have uh, tried to do the same 
I think the last one I saw was uh, Microsoft trying to do the same against their cloud. So uh, yeah, th that's not yeah. hard to do. Yeah, all right, I'll talk to you offline about it. Okay. Okay, finally, we're over time, but I did want to make sure we got the Patrick's things. Who is the keeper of the clusters, specifically secrets related to getting access to other clouds? That would, at the moment, be the test infra folks, uh, specifically the GKE EngProd team here at Google. Um, I have longer term dreams codified in issues of making on call a thing that everybody can do. Uh, the way we get to that is to have these clusters stood up in a uh, Google Cloud account that is managed by the CNCF so that non google.com people can be added to that Google Cloud account. But in the meantime, I think if you get in touch with us and make sure we are made aware that these are important issues to get merged, we should be able to work with you on that. We typically have one person who is on call for test infra. I think it's, uh, you can find out who it is. Let me find out if this is right now. It's not on dash call, maybe it's on call. Yeah, so uh, today, this week, you can go to that URI and you can go find out that you need to poke Eric Feta uh, as the point of contact, um, uh, Sen Lu or then the elder may also be of use. Does that answer your question on think, getting secrets into Prow? As a, as a side too, I think we, well, downstream we're having a, a similar issue, but like just solving the problem of we have, you know, it, for us it's also Azure, like secrets that we don't own that potentially other people might want to be giving to us to run jobs. Yeah. And then also giving them a means to rotate those without giving them access to um, our clusters, that's not really solved. Yeah. I will remain manual. Yeah, I mean, because ideally I'd want something that, you know, to service account, it has to be renewed every time period, you know, maybe daily. If, it, if I could automate it, that would be great. But Yeah, I think that's, that's a larger problem than I have the time to hash out yeah. the question today. But I think, yeah, like Steve said, it's an unsolved problem. So the way we're dealing with it right now is with humans and, and trust. But I agree those are things we should figure out how to solve. OK. All right, uh, thanks for that. Cool. Anything else from anybody? I am shocked I haven't gotten kicked out of my conference room yet. All right, cool. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. See you next week. Yeah, see ya.